Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship with First Baptist Church of Fort Payne, Alabama. I'm Marshall Henderson, the pastor of First Baptist Church. Our church exists because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we believe that the gospel is at the very heart of the message of the Bible, and it's at the very heart of who we are as God's people. It means that the gospel forms every part of our lives, and it informs every dimension of who we are and what we do as God's people. So in light of the gospel, we live for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we desire as a church to make Jesus Christ known through heartfelt worship, through disciple making, through missional living, and through devoting ourselves to one another in community. So today, however you're watching, I want you to know that the desire of our leadership is that you enter into a genuine and heartfelt time of worship with us as a church. Jesus is worthy of our praise, and he is worthy of all of our attention and our affection. And now, for all who are weary and need rest, and for all who mourn and long for comfort, and for all who fail and desire strength, and for all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide its doors to you, you are welcomed into worship this morning with a welcome that comes from Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. Well, good morning, and welcome into worship this morning with First Baptist Church of Fort Payne. It's a special day. It's a day where we as a church will take and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Uh, today, overall, if you think about it, if you think about our moment in time, uh, today is a day for remembering. Uh, our calendars bring us to a place and to a mindset um, you know, I know many of you personally this weekend and tomorrow, this is a day that's special and near and solemn. It is Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we remember those who have given their lives in service and sacrifice for a cause. And maybe you connect personally with that uh, through a family member. Um, and so your loss doesn't escape us. Uh, you are cared for and you have our prayers. Uh, today as a church family... As we worship, we turn our focus ultimately to remembering the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ through the Lord's Supper. And so as people today, as God's people today, we'll be remembering, we'll be celebrating, we'll be proclaiming Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection through taking a meal together. So that is the task of today. The task of today is to remember and to draw near in all ways as we worship together. So as we begin our worship, would you bow with me and let's pray. God, our Father, today we pause and we reflect upon the sacrifice made by those who paid the ultimate price on behalf of freedom. We pray their sacrifices are never forgotten. We pray we never forget the pain of their families. On this Memorial Day weekend, we pray, Lord, for peace and for those who gave all, we, may we be receptive to your guidance, and we, may we never forget uh, those who have given their lives. And God of every nation, as we remember those who gave their lives for our sake, let us be stirred to action by their memory. We confess that we have not done all that is possible to promote peace in our world. We confess that we have not loved our neighbors, let alone our enemies. Father, we ask your forgiveness for failing to live up to your commands. But we have come into worship this morning to draw near to you. We know that you have promised to pour out your love on us by your Spirit. We desire to know you 
and experience you. As we seek your kingdom and your righteousness this morning, Lord, empower us to work for your kingdom. and Give us a dedication to live for you. And may you be praised in all that we do, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now as I welcome you always into worship this morning, this time is for all who are weary and need rest, for all who mourn and long for comfort, for all who fail and desire strength, and for all who sin and need a Savior. You are welcomed into worship this morning with the welcome that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's worship together. Good morning. We uh, sing together. I stand amazed in the presence. I'll ask that you stand as we sing together. Good morning. Boys and girls, how many of you like to receive mail? We can receive important things in the mail. Now, your parents might receive a lot of bills in the mail, but thankfully you get to receive fun things like birthday party invitations, 
things like that. Have you ever noticed the mail is delivered to your home no matter what the weather's like? The mail carrier doesn't get up on a rainy day and say, oh, it's rainy and cold today. I'm not going to deliver the mail. No, that mail seems to come no matter what, doesn't it? Well, did you know that Jesus has an invitation that he wants to be delivered to everyone? This invitation is to come to him for forgiveness of sins and for salvation. And Jesus wants us to help deliver that invitation. Now, he's not asking us to deliver mail like a mail carrier, but he wants us to share the good news with others. John 20, 21 says, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So we should take seriously the job of delivering Jesus' invitation. We should share his good news, even if it's rainy or if it's cold. We should share his good news to all people. We should share the good news no matter what. Romans 10, 15 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Let's ask God to show us who needs to hear his good news today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending your only son to die for us. Father, help us to share this wonderful news with others. We just pray for others to know the truth, Father, and to receive you as their Savior. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to have Ola Head uh, here on the piano. Connie is out sick this week, and so we're thrilled that she's able to come over from Gadsden and play for our service. Good to see the Jennings here. Um, glad y'all have come. Well, as we continue our service uh, worship together, we come now to a time uh, of prayer. We're going to use the same song on both sides of the prayer, kind of bracketing it, uh, if you will. Um, so it's, you see it's there in the hymnal 455, or uh, the words will be on the screen. Uh, remain seated, though, uh, as we sing. You know, we, we take these moments because we recognize that no one comes into worship as a blank slate. So how has your week been? Uh, for many of us, this week has been disorienting and dismaying, uh, shocking and saddening, hasn't it? And my job is to remind you that when it feels like the bottom has fallen out of life, it hasn't. There's a firm foundation that we stand upon to, that enables us to repent well, to fight 
for a better future and for change, to mourn, to do the deeds of love, to pray for better, and ultimately to hope. You know, this is a day that on the church calendar, I I know we talked already about kind of the American calendar, but on the church calendar, today is Ascension Day for the church, Ascension Sunday, A, a day where we remember, right, built into our minds, we remember that Jesus, after being resurrected, ascended into the heavens, that Jesus, we remember Jesus reigns in power in all places and all times. We remember that Jesus pleads our case before the throne of the Father. We remember that Jesus has sent his spirit to be in us and to work through us. And we remember that he will come again to end all evil and to bring us into his presence forever. It's important to remember on days like this and in times like these, isn't it? So this morning, we just want to affirm our faith and to reinforce our faith with with these words. You'll see them on the screen. I ask you to join in with me in a moment in the words printed in yellow. We begin with John 14. This is Jesus speaking. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Listen to these words. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Will you join with me? God, whose glory fills our world. God, whose life is closer than breath. God, whose love is stronger than death. God, this God of life and love, has sent us an advocate to save us. Jesus Christ, the righteous, now at the right hand of God. Not to condemn, but to bring full life. Not to accuse, but to redeem. Not to reject, but to draw close. God, this God of life and love, has sent us an advocate to save us. Jesus Christ the righteous, now at the right hand of God. God who hears the cries of our seeking souls. God who sees the pain of our suffering bodies. God who feels the loss of our grieving spirits. God, this God of life and love, has sent an advocate to be with us forever. The spirit of truth abides with us eternally. God, before we teach and lead, within us to comfort and heal, around us to shield and protect, God, this God of life and love, has sent us an advocate to be with us forever. The spirit of truth abides with us eternally. Praise God. So again, we use in times like these, that third stanza changes just ever so slightly the direction of the song you sing. Again, remain seated while we sing. I'm very 
as we continue, uh, amazing love, my Lord, what love is this? We, uh, at the end of our sermon, we'll have a time of communion. So we begin already preparing our minds and hearts uh, to receive that. So we sing together, uh, number 168, or the words will be on your screen. Please stand. Let's sing together. remain standing for our scripture reading in just a moment. Our children, you're dismissed to Children's Church.
This morning's scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask, does this prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, He told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. In a, in a few moments, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. I, I hope that you were given a, a communion cup on your way in today. If you don't have one in this moment, if you didn't receive one already, uh, Dr. Danny and some deacons are around. Would you just slip up your hand? We want to make sure to get one to you now. Where is Danny? There he is. Right up here in the front. There's a couple on this side over here and then next to you. Close to you over there, Danny. Just lift your hand up and leave it up and wave it around or whatever you need to do. Babdicostal moments here, right? Let him go around with that. It's good, good. Oh, he's got to reload. These are good moments. These are holy moments. Well, as Danny makes his way around, again, just leave your hand up. Uh, We're talking about missional living again this morning. Uh, This is part two from Acts chapter eight. And as we begin, let me bring you up to speed on part one, in case you missed that. Uh, Three words, gospel, community, mission. These are the reasons that the church exists. So if we were to put everything the church does in a pot, if we were to boil it and distill it down, these three things would remain. Gospel, community, and mission. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is the core, at the core of who we are as a people. This message that by his own death and resurrection, Jesus has defeated sin, death, and hell and is making all things new, even us. That's at the core of who we are. So Jesus gets this thing started. He keeps it going. He gets us going. He keeps us going. He does it by his welcoming love. He does it by his sacrificial death, by which he's invited into his family, the brokenhearted. He has lifted the weak. He brings the unqualified into his presence through red, bloody doors. Jesus gets us going and keeps us going. And community, the community of God are those brokenhearted, those weak, those unqualified who because of Jesus are now in God's family, who because of Jesus has been, have been given a future and a hope, have been given life together now so that Jesus might do his healing work in us and through us. That's community. And transformation is a community project. What we become, we become together. Mission. Because Jesus doesn't allow us to stay selfish. What we're doing here is not to be spiritual sponges, 
what we're doing here is not self-help cloaked in religiosity or charismatic emotionalism. There is no such thing as Christianity without mission. Because Jesus said to his disciples then, as he says to all of us now, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So Jesus sent them. And Jesus sent us with his word and with his spirit. This is John 663 from the message translation. The spirit can make life. Sheer muscle and willpower don't make anything happen. You get that? There's a way to pry and to work and to fight, and to even be fierce, and nothing happens. Sheer willpower makes nothing happen. But Jesus said, every word I've spoken to you is a spirit word. And so every word I've spoken to you is a life-making word. You know, last week as we began the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, we found that Philip goes out with Jesus' word and with his spirit. Philip is actually in this scene that we read about because first of a great persecution in Jerusalem that scattered believers out of Jerusalem. And they go out like Philip goes out with just the spirit of God and the word of God. So... Uh, Philip knew he was scattered about. He didn't really have this organized idea or campaign. Philip is basically here because of the most disorienting thing you could possibly imagine, being driven away from where you live because of persecution. And all Philip is doing here is Philip is going, Philip is listening to the Holy Spirit, and Philip is simply saying yes. It's what spirit-filled people do. The next right thing, trusting the Lord. So we go out with word and with spirit. And it's it's not any impressiveness of our own. It's not really clever strategies. We don't need to be flashy. We don't need to out-clever God. We just need these lives. This is what I would say to you. As people living this missional life, we need these lives that are living by his word, walking with the spirit, that are just freely faithful and sacrificial and loving and humble and walking with the Lord. Yet, at the same time, marked by this, these generosities, these costly extravagances, marked by the love of Jesus. Listen, when you live a costly, loving life, people will find it threatening. So what? Live it. And here's how we know we're getting this kind of life right. We know it when our lives, through the work of the Holy Spirit, are like floodlights onto Jesus. This is an idea first given by J.I. Packer. We understand, we know we're doing it right when Jesus is not a prop in our lives, Jesus is not another means of a power play for our lives, Jesus is not just a good rhyming word for our worship songs. We know it when our lights spotlight Jesus, that we show Jesus for all that he is. He's not a theory, he's not a hypothetical, but he's a glorious reality. When we finally shine the light on the glorious Jesus who cannot be ignored, this Jesus brings the dead back to life. Not our campaigns, not our power plays. This is life making. So, So here's missional living. So we're almost up to speed from last week. A couple definitions. Missional living, this is from Tim Keller. Missional living is being the church whose members are actively bringing their Christian example and faith into the lives of their neighbors, friends, colleagues, and community. I love this one even more in this short. Ray Ortland. missional living is Christ in you with your sleeves rolled up. Our first point from Acts chapter 8 last week was this. Missional living is beginning and continuing Jesus' work in Jesus' way. Here's what we pick up with Philip. 
He is doing the next right thing after great success, evangelizing, performing miracles in Samaria. The Holy Spirit tells Philip to go to Gaza. There he encounters an Ethiopian eunuch. We're talking about someone who is a black African from the Upper Nile region. He's a eunuch, which means that he's castrated. He's not part of the royal family in Ethiopia, but he has been groomed and for leadership and government and prominence in that land. And we think for a moment, or I thought this was last week, we think like Philip's here. Philip goes to Samaria, which is a miracle. Philip talks to this Ethiopian eunuch, which is a miracle. How different are these two people? Racially different. The eunuch is a barbarian from the far reaches. This is in a Jewish man's mind, like Philip. One is sexually altered. And yet, here Philip is. That's one. New material today. Number two. Missional living requires that we live close to the heart of the Christian message. So I'm talking about every moment living. We keep our lives close. We live so close to the heart of the Christian message. So think about the story. The Spirit says to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And what we find in this chariot is there is a eunuch reading from the Isaiah scroll. Philip asked him something like this, do you, do you know what you're reading? And the unit responds, how can I unless someone guides me? Now, again, Acts 8 is a miracle. I feel like maybe in churches we used to talk more about this phrase like divine appointments. Sometimes we think through what are, what are these chance encounters that we sometimes see as chance encounters at, at first but are clearly orchestrated by the living God. And think about this. As Philip goes here, as Philip joins this chariot, what is the eunuch reading? Well, we're told it's a portion from Isaiah 53. And as it turns out, he's reading this portion that I would say is at the heart of the Bible. The very heart pumping in the middle of the biblical narrative. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Isaiah 53. The section that's quoted here in in Acts chapter 8 is from verses 7 and 8. But let me read a little bit more to you. And maybe maybe you can see how it's right at the center of the story. I love this because the Ethiopian just happened to be reading this. So Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1. It'll be on the screen as well. Who has believed what what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he uh, he is taken away. And as for his generation, who considers that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So the eunuch is reading this. And he asks Philip, because he wants to know, who is this passage about? Is it about the prophet or someone else? What is this 
servant's identity. Who is he? And Philip's able to answer, oh yes, I know him. I know him. He's completely unique. And so Philip begins with the scriptures, and he begins to unfold and tell the eunuch the story of Jesus, the one the scripture's about. And then we learn after this that the eunuch is baptized. This is an important detail because of what's happening here. There's this outward sign of his conversion. There's an outward sign in baptism that one way of life is over, a new way of life has begun. It's an outward sign that I've stopped believing this and I've begun believing this. It's an outward sign that my life has stopped being organized around this, but now it belongs to Christ and is organized around the words and the ways of Jesus. It's an outward symbol of that. He's like, here's water. What would stop me from doing that? You know, in, in your bulletin, there's a, there's, a little, there's a little part in there. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you haven't been baptized, if you have questions about that, if you're interested in that, there's a little document that I'll link you to to read about baptism, to answer questions you might have about that, to pray through that and obediently step into that. We're told after this, as the story goes, that Philip is carried away by the Spirit of the Lord, whatever that means, right? Spiritual teleportation of some sort. You can research it, all right? Now, important questions. We are told in this passage, so that's the details, we're told in this passage that the eunuch has come from Ethiopia, has gone to Jerusalem to worship, and is now on his way back. And I, maybe, just maybe, we should ask why. Like, why take this thousand-mile journey to go and worship? Think about his life back in Ethiopia. This is how much we know. He is essentially the CFO of Ethiopia under Queen Candace. We know he's a eunuch, so we know that he's paid an ultimate sacrifice for his success, for a shot at leadership, and for power. We know that he began outside of the royal family, but he entered into governmental life through castration. Think through that for just a moment, okay? And now, to make a journey to Jerusalem, he is making another ultimate sacrifice. And it's got to somehow make sense to us. You know, back then, you know, right, like, so we, we think through so often, uh, personal achievements tend to define who we are in the Western world, like we've accomplished this, and so we're known for that. That wasn't so in the ancient world. This man gave up any shot at a family, any shot of his family standing, any shot of legacy. That was what self-worth was measured, by, by which was measured in the ancient world. And so with this pursuit of becoming CFO under Queen Candace, uh, he made the ultimate wager. He now has no shot at children, no shot at the blessing of sexual fulfillment, no bearing children, no family, no name, no future. He's actually wagered, and in his life is what possible, what we seem to all fear, being forgotten. And he makes this wager with his life and with his future that way, considering that what he would gain would be greater. And he seems to have gained it. He's there. Yet he makes his journey to Jerusalem. Why? I mean, it would be enormous risk for him. The time it took to travel, leaving his post, even the risk of losing the position he'd worked so hard to gain. Why? Listen, I'm, I can only speculate here. But I would assume because within him there is enormous emptiness. And, you know, just like others in the ancient world, he's going to Jerusalem, to the temple, because like others in the ancient world, there's something attractive about the Hebrew God to him that he would leave it in order to find something. Now, you want to hear something sad? That this eunuch would have been saved a whole lot of trouble if he would have only been in possession of a scroll of the book of Deuteronomy. Here's what I know. I know that when he would have gotten to the temple in Jerusalem, they wouldn't have let him in. You see, the temple then was regulated by the Mosaic law. 
It regulated who could come into the temple for worship and who could not come into the temple for worship. So you find in the Old Testament all these regulations about those who touched a dead body or someone who has mold in their house. They couldn't come in until the appropriate rites were performed. There's a spiritual idea behind it. It's the, idea, it's, it's the picture, it's to really give you a, a, a visual picture of the holiness of God. That we are sinful. It's an object lesson that we must be cleansed to be in God's presence. And if the eunuch had had a copy of the book of Deuteronomy or a scroll there, in that book it clearly states that eunuchs expressly are forbidden from entering into the temple or the assembly of the Lord. It's Deuteronomy 23.1. He would have been forbidden from entering. No eunuch, no castrated person can enter, and so he's gone to all this trouble. And he's on his way back. All right, so we're piecing the story together a little bit. And he's reading from the Isaiah scroll. Why? Well, consider what he's reading. He's reading about this mysterious figure in Isaiah, one who is scorned for others, one who is disfigured for others, one who is wounded to make others whole, a lamb who silently goes to the slaughter, dying in the place of sheep who have gone astray. He's reading about one who became a lamb. He's reading about one who became a person of derision, one who became a man of sorrows, an outcast, one who was cut off from the land of the living. In Isaiah 53, like some other related passages here in this section, they are these servant songs. They are a job description of sorts for a servant who would come and accomplish God's will to rescue Israel and to rescue the world. And if you were to take from Isaiah 53, if you were to keep reading in the Isaiah scroll, you would read about how this servant's sacrificial work accomplished this mission and brought blessing to the world. You would read in Isaiah 54 about a new covenant that's given. In Isaiah 55, you would read about a new creation that's coming. And then in Isaiah 56, you would read about a blessing that's even for outsiders and foreigners, and yes, a blessing that's even available for eunuchs. Let's think about Isaiah 56 for a second. You can, you can flip over in your Bible there if you want to just kind of peruse the talk. Isaiah 56 addresses different groups of people. So to eunuchs, those that have had their reproductive organs castrated. So to eunuchs, don't call yourself a dry tree. What you have bodily is no shot at children, no shot at the blessing of sexual fulfillment, no shot at bearing children, no family, no name, no future. You're destined to be forgotten, but to the eunuchs, don't say that about yourself. I will give you a name that is better than sons and daughters, Isaiah says. I will give you an everlasting name. You will have the loving gaze of God. You will have his name. You will have an everlasting seat at his family's table. How about that? And to those outsiders, to the foreigners, those ethnically outside of Israel, Gentiles, foreigners to the covenant of God, those who weren't born into Israel, maybe those who came in, who would, who those who would willingly join themselves to the Lord. He says, yes, come and worship, and I will delight in your worship, and I will make you joyful. Right? And he goes on to say in Isaiah 56 that my house will be a house of prayer for all people. And it's interesting. I, I don't know if in Philip's talk with the eunuch, as, as Philip is walking through the scriptures and through the life of Jesus, I don't know if Philip takes him to the scene where Jesus is in the temple overturning money changers and those doing business in the Gentile courts. I don't know if he tells him about Jesus drove out those who were doing business and making worship for outsiders nearly impossible, but surely, surely he talks about the Jesus whose house is a house of prayer for all people. A God who says, you're welcome 
with no asterisk. I want you here. I am gathering the outsiders and telling them they belong. It's an Isaiah scroll. Now, if we're to think about the story, can't we see that finding out who this person is is of ultimate importance to the eunuch? Jesus tells him about, I mean, Philip tells him about Jesus, the one who became a lamb, the one who became a leper for the lepers, the one who became a eunuch, so to speak, to bring the eunuchs in. Here's the heart of the Christian Christian message, that because of our sin, all of us, this eunuchs, all of us, are deserving to be excluded and cut off from living. Instead, Jesus was, so that we could be brought in. Listen, as we think about missional living, we've got to be able to take people to the heart of the gospel message, and this simply this, that salvation is not through law-keeping, it is through grace. We've got to know and be convinced, all of us, And just know how the good news is actually good. In Jesus, God didn't come down as a general. He didn't come so that the strong could summon up their their strength and be obedient. If he did come down as a general, our religion would just be a religion of nothing but laws. And to be blessed and to be successful, you would have to be absolutely obedient. That's not the way it came. And in Jesus, God didn't come down as a holy person, enlightenment coach, our solution for our problem is not self-knowledge. We're not ultimately saved or changed by self-awareness. Knowing something about yourself doesn't necessarily give you the ability to change yourself or save yourself. If we could just be told how we're wrong or told about ourselves, that would be one thing. But Jesus had to die which means that we need a stronger brew than that. We need more than the right rules and the right techniques and the right methods and the right instincts. The good news of Jesus is for people like us who so often know what we should do and should not do, and yet we know that somehow we cannot do it by ourselves. For people like us who needed someone to die in our place. So the heart of the Christian message is substitutionary sacrifice. Think about it. The deepest revelation of the nature of God is on the cross. His greatest glory is in his willingness to die. His greatest beauty is to being disfigured. His greatest future to give all of us is to be cut off, to be scorned, to be ended. His greatest victory over evil comes by the cross so that one day he can end all evil without ending us. All life-changing love is going to be substitutionary sacrifice. It's Peter on the beach and Jesus saying, feed my sheep, after Peter's denied him three times. It's the woman caught in in adultery and Jesus saying, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Someone has suffered the cost in your place. Someone has exchanged himself for you. And this story, this cosmic story, is the most electrifying story that's ever been told. That love and suffering is what actually changes people. And Christ has done it for us. And I would say this is the key for us in missional living. So yes, doing Jesus' work in Jesus' way. But also this, living close to the heart of the Christian message. When we know of this sacrifice for us, when we know we were outside and we were brought in by grace, how much more having been convinced of it. Well, we want to live as agents of this wonderful story and this wonderful message. 
When we think about living this way to truly help anyone, to truly love anyone in great need, there is going to be an element in our lives now, think horizontally, there will have to be an element in our lives of costly personal exchange because all life-changing love toward people in serious needs will be substitutionary sacrifice. It simply means this, we think about living, that you have to get low to elevate the lowly. You have to give up strength to strengthen the weak. You have to have some insecurity to give security to others. You have to absorb a debt to forgive or even to give generously. You have to be uncomfortable to give comfort and so on. Costly personal exchange is the heart of the Christian message. So how do you see it in your life? How do you see your life living close to the heart of the message? You've got to be able to live and move and be and speak in a certain way that people understand that salvation is not through law keeping, but through grace. Where do you see costly personal exchange in your life? Where is that driving your life? Think about it. Jesus' word, Jesus' spirit, life-changing love. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful formula? May it be true of us. And may we never, 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 never get away from the very heart of the message we believe. We move into a time of taking the Lord's Supper together. It's a time where we come together and we remember around the table These actions together are meant to reinforce what I'm talking about. It's meant to reinforce the very heart of who we are as a people. As we come to the table this morning, we will remember the good news that brings us here. If you would, join with me in what's printed on the screen here. Question and answer that might draw us into the table together. What right do we have to dine at the table of Jesus? As children of God, through faith in Jesus, We have every right to dine at his table. So what do we mean by this? We mean that Jesus came not for the strong, but for the weak. Not for the righteous, but for sinners. Not for the self-sufficient, but for those who know they need rescue. He came for all those who are weary and need rest. He came for all those who mourn and long for comfort. All who feel worthless and wonder if God even cares. All who fail and desire strength. He came for all those who sin and need a Savior. Jesus welcomes all those into his circle, adopts them into his family, and reserves a place at his table. For he is the mighty friend of sinners, the lover of his enemies, the defender of the weak, the justifier of the inexcusable, He is a Savior who has given his life for us. And by faith in Jesus, we are welcomed into the joyful feast of the Lord forever. You know, every time we come to this table together, we proclaim a story. We tell a story that Jesus told us to tell until the day that he returns. The story is this, that on the cross, Jesus' body was broken for us Jesus' blood was shed for us. We tell the story like the Isaiah scroll told the eunuch about Jesus' actions as our substitute. He was a man of sorrows, but they weren't his own. And though we are the guilty ones, God shifted the blame to Jesus and laid on him the iniquity of of us all. We're reminded at this table of the great exchange, the sweet exchange that's available to all of us that Christ on the cross took our sin. We receive his righteousness by faith. We receive God's forgiveness. We receive the promise of God's presence in all things, his acceptance and his joy in us and with us forever. And that is a sweet exchange, isn't it? As we come to the table together, if you would take the cup that's been given to you, 
And would you open the bread portion and take it? Church, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. Now, if you would open the cup portion. Church, this is the blood of Christ given for you. Take and drink. Here again, Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we praise you for your son, Jesus Christ. And in this moment, we remember his sacrifice. In this moment, we take moments of worship to let his sacrifice resonate deeply within us. Father, we take these moments to see and to savor savor our Lord Jesus Christ. And in you, we find rest. We find all the encouragement our souls need. We find our strength. And we find nourishment through the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, we turn to you once again in heartfelt worship. You are worthy of all our admiration and our attention and our affection. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We close this morning. We're going to sing together. So Roger and the team will come up and lead us in our final song. Will you stand with me as we sing? Yeah.
Amen. Let me give you a couple reminders and a few invitations as we go out of worship this morning. As always, as we gather for worship, uh, your worship spills over into into giving, and you're invited to give of your tithes and your offerings. There are offering plates located behind you in the foyer. Uh, This beautiful arrangement of flowers this morning are uh, here in memory of Lee Schwartz. He was a major in the United States Army, so we remember Lee today as well. Uh, You'll see in your bulletin that there are uh, some college graduates listed, and if you know of any others who who we may have missed, uh, please let us know, but congratulations to those who have accomplished another uh, level in their education. Uh, The church office will be closed uh, for Memorial Day holiday, so may you have a a wonderful and a safe holiday together. I'll remind you, if you're part of Golden Circle, you will meet this Tuesday. Uh, It's Cover Dish, and it's at 10 a.m., at the typical time that you meet. And then uh, as we go out this morning, you're reminded to pray for our, our youth choir and the leaders and the chaperones who go with them this week as they head out just right after church, 1130, uh, to head out for youth choir tour. And they'll be back leading us next week in worship uh, as they come back uh, for that homecoming um, concert, homecoming concert. That's the word I'm looking for. I'm out of words, all right? That's all. Would you stand with me this morning? receive our benediction as we go out of worship. So if you would raise your hands and receive the blessing. May the love of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Go in peace.